and welcome everybody to All Things Global, Episode 8, powered by Vista Tech. Uh, we thank everybody for joining today. Uh, today's episode is with, going to be with Professor John Ritzdorf. Um, we're super excited to speak with him about the history of localization and perhaps where the future will take us. Uh, I'm your host, Suzanne Frank. I'm your host, Dominica D'Agostino. And I'm your host, Bull Weber. So a very warm welcome to the episode eight of All Things Global, powered by Vistatech. We hope your summer is going well, and we tr truly appreciate uh, your time tuning in to this episode. Uh, All Things Global was created to inspire compelling academic conversations and fresh ideas for people who develop long-term global strategies. And we are very excited to have John Ritzdorf with us today. Uh, John, as Suzanne mentioned, is an adjunct professor at Middlebury Institute of International Studies. His full-time job is actually that of a senior manager of global content solutions at Procore. And his career spans uh, over 20 years. Uh, I think like most of us, he went through a variety of different roles in the industry from translator, to engineer uh, solutions and ultimately, I think, focusing on global strategy. Uh, and I think that his bio also reflects a wide spectrum of his interests and passions. Um, so before we kick it off um, today's conversations, uh, let me just address two uh, housekeeping, housekeeping items. Uh, one of them is that uh, since we had such a huge interest in this event this time around, uh, we decided not to have on-screen audience and give everybody a chance to ask your questions. Uh, so in this way, you can submit the questions in the chat box below, and we will make sure to address them at the end of the session. Uh, and yeah, let's kick it off. Uh, so let's start the conversation about uh, diving into you know, the history of localization, why it matters, uh, and how does it inform the future. Uh, Bull, do you want to take it away? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Domi. And welcome, John. Very excited to have you here. Uh, we've got a full house today. We've got well over 100 people. Very excited about that. And I think that really speaks to uh, how we've, we, we, we've picked a very good topic. Um, in, in, in my circles within the industry, there's a lot of interest, uh, or there's general feeling that we're at an interesting inflection point. There's a lot of uh, focus on the future um, and a lot of curiosity about what the implications of things like AI and large language models are going to be. Um, and as we all know, the, the past informs the future. Um, and so it's a particularly relevant time, I think, to be looking uh, at the history. But let's get it straight from the horse's mouth. What's your view? Why is it important to look at the history of localization and why now? Why should everybody care? Yeah, so I think the, 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 the I've been thinking about this for a good, I'd say, at least five years. So, wow. um, yeah, it's I've talked about it with various people uh, and. I think the reason why this is the time is every time there seems to be a, a kind of language industry shakeup moment, right, of which we're in right now yet again with, with generative AI and everything, I see that people who have not been in the industry for a long time have this panic moment, right? Um, and the thing is, is that I, I try to tell them that they, there is context for this, that this moment that we are experiencing, we have experienced time and time again. It's just you weren't there for the last 30, 40, in some cases, 30, 40 years of history to see it play itself out over and over again. So it's like even, you know, with politics or anything else, sometimes we say, oh, my God, it's a, you know, never done, been done before. No, you look back far enough in history and you see this has happened before. Right. So history is really great because I think it kind of grounds us. It helps shape our definition of where we are in our industry. It helps us understand and appreciate how far we've come. It also helps give us context for understanding how we're going to navigate through whatever crisis, if it's a crisis or whatever game changing paradigm moment we're in by just looking at the past and saying, well, every other time this has happened, this is how it turned out. Right. Um, and that there's no real need to uh, to 
you know, panic, worry. There's usually a lot of panic. It's almost always panic, but panic, worry, or get too excited. That's another thing that happens too, right? The excitement is, is a big piece of it. People are super excited. Um, but with the excitement usually comes a little bit of panic. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's a there's a ton of good uh, examples of recent events where historical context is useful. Uh, you know, with generative AI, we can look all the way back to the beginning of the Georgetown experiment in 1954, uh, where, you know, the very first NLP, NLP was invented in 1954, basically, along with the beginning of the Georgetown experiment where machine translation got its first uh, introduction uh, and uh, and produced uh, Russian translations of English sentences. And that was the beginning of hype cycles, which continued over and over again and have never stopped uh, for decades. So, yes. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, another thing that's happening is that a lot of localization professionals, um, certainly all of the kerfuffle around generative AI uh, is generating a lot, generating a lot of pressure on those professionals from their managers above them and from the business right. units above them who are wondering just as they did in 2016 with, uh, with neural machine translation, uh, not necessarily is this the panacea, but are there opportunities to dramatically cut costs and right. improve turnaround times, et cetera, et cetera. So they're responding to this pressure um, from above as well. That's, that is that's absolutely right. it. And the thing is, that's the thing. The, the, this, this has happened over and over again. We look at 2016 with the introduction of neural MT. We look at 2006 with the introduction of statistical MT, which was a game changer at the time. Google Translate really is what came out. Um, which was killing off Babelfish, which was what we used up until that point, which was so nightmarish that nobody would touch it. But that was the days of rules-based machine translation, and very few people were able to make, make good use of rules-based machine translation. Um, so, you know, there has been time and time again these kinds of incidents. T the, the rise of TMS from just being this kind of geeky, weird thing that people tinkered about with in the early 2000s when we had really the first major players in that area, which were like XTM and Lingotech back in those days. Um, and then eventually the rise of DMS too also created these kinds of corporate conversations where people were being pitched by companies like Smartling in the 2010s, you know, you've got senior executives getting called and being told that they should be doing things better and then localization teams being pressured uh, under that. So, you know, it's it happens over and over again, and it's always the same repeated thing. And if you have that context of knowing, we've been through this before, here's how we got through it. This is how to have those conversations, you know, hype cycles happen. This is all about what they call the hype cycle, right? You have the hype cycle, the hype gets to a crescendo. Uh, everybody's talking about it. everybody's like, oh my God, it's going to be game changing. The whole world's going to modify, like everybody's going to lose their jobs. Like there's always this stuff, right? Everybody's going to lose their jobs. Nobody's going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly you get to what's called in the hype cycle, the trough of disillusionment, which we're still heading towards for Gen AI. Gen AI, we're slowly getting there though. I can feel it. We kind of hit, I think we've kind of hit peak AI. I think most of us have. My feeling is always like, if I'm sick of reading about it, then I think the rest of the world's probably <laughs> sick of reading about it. So I think we're hitting that peak point and I think we're heading towards that. And eventually we're going to hit the trough of disillusionment where everybody's going to find the limitations. Everybody's going to be like, oh yeah, it can do this, but eh, it doesn't do it well, or it's not good enough. Or we're going to have our first, which we're starting to see now, our first few major snafus, which always happens too, right? Um, where mm. things go horribly wrong. So we looked at 2016 and, you know, neural tr machine translation and people machine translating their websites and it's saying horrible things on the website. Uh, you know, I can't give you a historical one right now, but there's tons from the past, um, you know, uh, but there's already been one here for, you know, neural. There's been ones with the legal, uh, the the guys who got, the lawyers got punished for bringing up fake case law that didn't exist, you know. Uh, so we look at, you know, Gen AI and we're going to have the same kinds of things happen. So it, yeah. It's always the same cycle over and over again. Are there any patterns, uh, John, that you think are, that you're seeing repeated from a, the history perspective around AI or does anything seem different this time? I'd say things get incrementally improved each time. 
I think the patterns are related to that hype cycle that I just talked about. Like the pattern is that the hype cycle is always there up and down, up and down. But to change context and go away from technology, the other pattern we see all the time, let's get on the corporate side or the business side, is the introduction of, and this is primarily on the on the uh, vendor side of our industry, the introduction of private equity and venture capital getting involved in language uh, business, realizing it might not always be the smartest move, and then pulling out. So this is kind of a repeated thing. We see this again, historical context, primarily around language technology. So I hope I don't, you know, piss anybody off too much here, but it's 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 true. We see this over and over again. The most notable one that I survived through um, was, uh, you know, 2007, I believe, or 2008, when Idiom World Server at the time was purchased by SDL at a basic, basically a fire sale where the private equity investors, or uh, actually I think it was venture capital in that case, venture capital investors in Idiom who thought they were gonna take over the world with this amazing thing that at the time was called GMS or, or GCMS, Global Content Management System, but now it's called TMS. This amazing thing, Idiom, was gonna take over the universe and everybody was gonna buy it and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly it turned out, nope, you couldn't make more than 10 million out of that business. And at that point, you know, venture capital, those people were just like, all right, we tried and it was over. Um, and it was sold basically at a fire sale to uh, to SDL and SDL took it over and, and you know, continued to, to work its magic on that. Um, you know, by the way, I want to point out, I am not, I should point this out right now. I do not know the whole story behind any of these things. I just have it all anecdotally third party or stuff that I've read or stuff that I've studied. I am super geeky about studying localization and watching the trends as we go on. I love reading about it. I used to consume every piece of content I could, especially in the early 2000s and 2010s primarily. Um, but, you know, Obviously, there are people who really worked there. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important we get a historical record, because I'm just giving you guys, you know, hearsay right now. I want to point that out. The people we should be hearing from are the people who worked at Idiom, you know, the people who worked at Idiom and lived through this and, and started it and founded it. And the people who, you know, uh, I'll throw do some name dropping here. Peter Reynolds, who works at MemoQ, who worked at Idiom, right? Uh, he knows, I'm sure, the whole story. That guy is like literally a walking history book of localization for the last 30 years. He's lived through every technological change. Um, but he also saw, you know, a lot of the, the the corporate side of it as well with the venture capital and, and private equity and stuff. So, you know, people like Peter, I would love to hear from and have them recorded and 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 on on record for for what was happening in those days. And not to get off the AI subject, but you have mentioned that you have seen kind of a lack of the recording of the historic history of localization. What, why do you think now is the right time to, to start thinking about recording localization? Do you think we'll completely lose our history? I think we're at risk already. I think we're starting to see it now. I think we are at risk of losing our history. So localization re history really kind of starts I mean, by most accounts and by most things I can find online, because I do still look this stuff up, um, starts really around the mid 80s. So mid 80s is where you first start to see real mentions of it. Um, it's mentioned in, um, you know, here and there in these kind of PC and computer related magazines. It's kind of mentioned here and there. Um, you know, multilingual goes back to the late 80s, uh, you know, before it was called multilingual, it was called international computing or something. Somebody can correct me on that, but it goes back to the late 80s. You know, it, it, those people now are retiring. Uh, we've unfortunately lost a few people because uh, they've passed away. And I, I do feel at this point that if we do not get the record of what I consider to be the first generation of localization professionals. If we don't get them on record soon, we will lose the earliest history pieces. So if we don't do it now, we're probably at risk um, because the few people who I have really close connections to who are the, what I would consider first generation localizers, um, most of them are retired by now. Um, and some of them have been lost. Uh, so yeah, it's unfortunate. I think so, that's a true. Yeah. 
all of this anecdotal reference, you know, uh, you kind of pointed at some uh, nail biting stories from the early days that, you know, if we recorded them and heard them straight from the people who were there, I'm sure that they would be very gripping. But um, what do you think then is the hook, so to speak, to get non-localization folks interested in localization history? It, th that was a tough one for me, and I thought about this for for again over the last five years. This has just been this thing that's been mulling around in my head. I'm like, God, I would love to record the history, but at the same time, how do we get people who aren't interested in it interested in it? And so I I kind of looked to um, I love watching documentaries, and I love watching geeky documentaries. I guess to some degree, like you know, the my favorites are things like, especially financial crime. I don't know why. I just have a thing for financial crime. So I love watching financial crime things about, you know, the collapse of Enron or Bernie Madoff or uh, anything related to that. And so I've been thinking about like, what are some of the biggest scandals we've had in the industry or things that could get other people interested? And so I thought out of one of them, one of them that I think majority of people I run into do not know because you'd have to be pretty, pretty what I consider first or second generation localizer, maybe third local generation localizer to know this is the Lernout, uh, Lenout and Houseby. I can never say it correctly. LNH is what they called it. Um, LNH was at the time before Enron was the largest corporate scandal in the history of the planet. It happened to be a language technology company and their technology went on to ultimately produce Dragon Naturally Speaking, which ultimately got rolled into Nuance, which ultimately controls all the speech to text we do today. So like they were the founders of that, but that was a huge corporate scandal at the time. I mean, a, a monstrous. Uh, so you, if you're saying me too, and I know that one, you know, you must be either first, second, first or most likely first or second generation localizer because most people don't know L and H uh, when you talk to them. Um, I barely knew it and I consider myself second generation. So, um, but yeah, it was a brazen worldwide fraud that was run. Uh, the people uh, got three year prison sentences in the end. Uh, you know, it, it was a series of shell companies that were set out and financed uh, and uh, ultimately they were fined uh, find crazy amounts of money. Their their stock. They were high flying. They were everywhere. In fact, let me give you a historical thing. This is a copy of Multilingual, the oldest one I own. This is from two thousand. Uh, no, nineteen ninety nine, November of nineteen ninety nine. I think this one or November two thousand. But anyways, it's issue number thirty five, right here. Uh, oh my God. You know, of course, I'm not going to be able to. Find, here it is, right here. This page, L and H translator. This is all about their machine translation technology and all that stuff that, you know, back then it was, you know, rules-based, it was whatever. But, you know, at the time it was considered revolutionary what they were doing and everybody was investing in them. They were getting private equity money from all over the place. Everybody wanted to put money into these guys. Ultimately it was corporate fraud and people lost millions and millions of dollars. And, uh, you know, it completely fell apart. So by the way, you want the best historical record ever, not to plug multilingual, go ahead and get their thing that allows you to see every issue starting from number one to the present. I actually think this is the best recording of our history that we have. It has every advertisement from every dead LSP that no longer exists, every technology that no longer exists. I mean, you look through here, there's crazy stuff, you know, you'll find stuff in here and you're like, what the hell? I didn't even know these things. Like, here's my old company that I worked for. The very first company I worked for is called IAC. It doesn't exist anymore. It was ultimately acquired by We Localize. It was actually acquired by another company, then acquired by We Localize. So a long history of, you know, acquisitions and stuff as well that are interesting. So, but that's just one scandal. Sorry, L&H is one scandal. <laughs> what other scandals are there? Other fun scandals to capture people. Anybody who doesn't know about the trans perfect, uh, you know, jilted lover, uh, you know, Phil and Liz and 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 their whole epic, there are great things online. I got to tell you, I looked this up just before I came on today. Not only is there a Forbes article about that whole drama, there's even a podcast where they talk about it called Trashy Divorce Podcast. <laughs> I had heard they, I had heard employees were internally betting 
on who was going to win the case when they were going in the thick of it. You know, there was there was money and wagers taking yeah. place. Yes, yes. And there's even there's even a, in the digital commons for University of Maryland, there's even a whole case law study of this whole thing. So that one's an amazing story. Like if you need a one that has drama and people and characters who are very, you know, uh, you know, embattled and, and a long, interesting drawdown story. That wouldn't be a great one to throw out there for scandal. Um, other disasters that I've lived through, again, I can only give the context of the ones I've seen and, and I've dealt with. E-Translate was one, nobody really, and again, if you're first or second gen, third gen, maybe of localization, you might know E-Translate, but E-Translate was really the first, was the first, you know, major, like in your face LSP that got recognition as like, oh my God, these guys are hot. They're awesome. Um, I don't know how to, I don't even know if we have an equivalent today. I don't even know. I, I guess they're just the most prominent, like in your face, Silicon Valley, go get them. E-translate, same thing. Same one of these corporate stories of like venture capital fulls, full, you know, comes in, they've, you know, they're awesome. They're high flying. They built their own technology uh, for an early translation management system that, you know, ran on the internet, which was an amazing thing back then. Um, it was the first translation ma management system that, you know, it had like, you know, you could do stuff with it and it had a web interface. Like it was all this cool stuff that was really hot back then. Um, and ultimately they wrote, uh, they raised, uh, it says, I'm looking here. I have notes here, 43 million in their second round of venture capital. Uh, and um, investors included Goldman Sachs, Bain Capital, uh, you know, GE Equity, GE is in General Electric. Um, ultimately, again, uh, another collapse, major collapse, uh, ended up being sold to translations.com. And if any of you know their Global Link technology and project director, that, that's what this is. This is the, 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 the fundamentals of that. It was started from eTranslate's software, which was then called Convey Software, which then eventually bought, got bought by translations.com back in 2002 when I was even there and, uh, and was rolled in and eventually became the, the part of the billion dollar company we know today. So, you know. A few funny, a few funny bits from the chat box, mm. um, just to, to add to what you're saying. Yeah. Um, one person, Casey Garland says, this is the most fascinating webinar I've ever attended. <laughs> uh, somebody else, uh, Carrie says, I feel old, LOL. Uh, in if you know everything I'm talking about, you're probably a little older. <laughs> well, here's one from Inger. Uh, 1984 was the first in my class to use a computer for translations back in Norway. So yeah. very, very interesting. There are people that have been around a long time. Um, and then there was somebody else that maybe was one of your former students that says, you should start a class of L10N uh, scandals. I, I, yeah, well, actually, I do want to start. I have been talking for years at Miss that I do want to start a history of localization course. I just worry that it's going to be much. I, I, I make the joke that it's very much going to be, I think, like, you know, history of magic in Harry Potter, you know, with everybody falling asleep in class. I, I just don't know how to, I'm still trying to figure out. I've been reading online, like, how do you make a history class interesting? Like, what do you have to do? I even asked my kids. Like, what do your history teachers do to keep you guys interested in the history? One thing was to bring artifacts, but other things are to play games like Jeopardy. Um, it's just tough. I think it's tough to figure out how do I keep it entertaining? Uh, mm -hmm. And so some of the scandals and controversy are helpful for that. I think, you know, these huge collapses and, yeah. and things that people just don't know that happened, I think, or yeah. people have forgotten happened. Yeah. People are very interested in that. We do yeah. have one question, but before we get to it, is it okay if I ask a question, Bull? Sure. Yeah. Um, because oh, I know both. you're handling the questions. Um, this <laughs> is not, not to get off topic, but what I see a pattern of right now, and this is not so much historical, but this is kind of the right now we see, and you probably have experienced it uh, previously in your historical context, but what I see right now is I see a lot of local uh, technology companies in their lo localization divisions laying people off, and they're typically laying off their more expensive and seasoned talent. And then as vendors, we're working with the less localization mature folks, and that's fine. Where the challenge comes in is with these venture capitalists and with these 
uh, various stakeholders that they have to report to, they're maybe not, there might be a disconnect because they're like coming through the ranks as translators. The VC companies and the stakeholders want to talk business and revenue. They want to talk translation and, and process. Right. How do we fill that gap? That, that seems to be a big gap right now in the industry. I, and I know Melissa Biggs of Locale Solutions uh, and I have had some conversations around that, but it's, I don't think anybody has the answer. What are your thoughts? Oh, man, I, you know, I having dealt myself too with a, a lot of people who are kind of inexperienced in local, but kind of end up dumped in those positions. Um, you know, I think I think us continuing to educate kind of gets a little off history, but I think education is key. Uh, you know, um, continuing to uh, have things like the short courses that they have at like Localization Institute and things like that is important. Um, you know, on the corporate level, it depends. On, it, it, when you're in an LSP, you're usually not going to be talking to the venture capitalists. You're not going to be talking to the C-suite. You're not going to even be talking to VPs. You're lucky if you can even get one step above the person who got assigned. And I've been in situations in an LSP where one time we were they had actually given all the localization work to the intern. So, um, you know, I'd say, you know, just keeping open with education. I think that switching it back to a historical context, one of the things that I think that has been great that we've done as part of our history as time has gone on is we've begun to create, like localization has gone from being in the, sh completely in the shadows where literally, again, pulling out books for you guys. This was the only way to learn about localization in 2000. Good luck. Outside of this and a copy of Multilingual, this was what you got. You got this, this, and I'll show you the other textbooks of 1990s and 1990s localization. This is what you got, you know, this guy, nice and thick, by the way. You know, we've moved out of that era and we've moved to the era where you can actually go online and say, hey, what is this localization thing? And you get courses presented to you that you can take. Um, there's the master's degree at Miss. Uh, there's the certificate at University of Washington. So it definitely within the history of localization, we've finally seen it kind of come out of the shadows and be the super geeky, weird thing that only a handful of people do to something that is more accessible to people now. So, yeah. That's not even the end of my books, by the way. I even have, uh, if you want, creating worldwide software on Solaris. Yeah, anybody? Fascinating. And you know, <laughs> your your question about how to make it, um, how to make history of localization interesting, I think is answered in a way by this very animated chat discussion yeah. where both the older generation who remembers some of the scandals and histories of the past, as well as the brand new generation that is coming, you know, out of MISS and other um, institutions is, you know, super interested in, it seems. Uh, one last question, quite question from me before we go uh, to the questions from the audience. You have, um, you know, an unprecedented access to the young people and the new lock leaders, um, you know, being able to teach them. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, um, you know, looking into the future, um, what skills and knowledge areas do you recommend they focus on to thrive in this very dynamic field of localization right now? Oh, ouch. Oh, uh, man. Uh, oh, what areas? I would say business, right? Biz I, I think at the end of the day, everybody speaks business. So like, you know, when you start at the, it, it, when you start with your beginning career, it's about managing translation memories and talking with the vendors and, you know, dealing with language quality issues and blah, blah, blah. But no matter what, inevitably, as your growth, your career growth goes, right, you're going to now have to start talking to business stakeholders who don't care about any of those details. They could care less. So I think the most important thing is to have some level of understanding of what on the corporate level, and this is within LSPs too, by the way, this is not just client side, this is vendor side too. Once you go up in vendor side, you know, the conversation stopped being about, you know, linguist equality here and you know an issue there they start become or about you know did we produce the right stuff for dtp it starts to become about like where are the revenues at how what are the margins looking like uh you know that's lsp side right what are our gross margins looking like uh you know are we profitable on this customer or not what do we need to do to to, to turn this around etc right um on the client side you're having to talk to people who totally don't understand your world at all, zero context. And you really have to get it down to like, how is localization making a financial impact to 
you know, push the business forward. Uh, you know, why, why does our team need to exist essentially is what you're fighting for, right? Why do we need to exist? Why, why do we need to be here? So um, that interestingly, from a historical perspective has never changed. And that's why I think that would be the one thing I would say is consistent, right? It doesn't matter what industry you're in, it doesn't matter what field you're in, you're going to have to learn to present business ideas to business stakeholders. You need to be able to present, you know, Nobody wants to hear about linguistic quality issues when they're a senior manager. They want to hear about, you know, what the revenues are looking like. Are we profitable or not? Uh, you know, what what trends do we have in a year over year, quarter over quarter basis? That's the kind of stuff people care about. And when you look into venture capital and private equity stuff as well, you also start to get a sense. And I think that's another thing that area area that people should un be very familiar with is what does that mean? What does that mean when you are private equity backed or venture capital backed, right? What does that mean in terms of, in terms of history? There's a cycle to that too. No matter what company, there's always a cycle. If you're private equity owned, there's a cycle to that, right? A cycle of, of you know, getting acquired. And then there usually being a timeline of anywhere from three to 10, but usually more like five to seven years before private equity pulls out and sells you or puts you public or whatever, right? So, yeah. yeah. Interesting. I, uh, a couple of questions for me, John. I think uh, something that I'm wondering about is as we look to history to inform the future, we've talked about some of the famous scandals that have occurred um, and you uh, coined a great phrase that I think I'm going to use moving forward. I think you said the trough of disillusionment. Yeah, it's so part of the of, hype cycle. <laughs> yeah, in the hype cycle, there's this, this rapid adoption curve, or at least interest curve. Um, and then there's disillusionment that comes when there's the, the you know, broad consensus that, hey, maybe this is not uh, quite the game changer that we thought maybe it was going to be. I'm curious, as you look ahead, uh, what do you see as being some of the, uh, this is kind of a strange question, but what, what do you see as being the, the significant setbacks or disappointments that localization professionals are going to have as they begin to try to adopt generative AI tools? Um, and then the second part would be, once that's all sort of gotten all worked out in the wash, what do you envision it looking like? two years from now, five years from now, when the dust has settled uh, and these technologies uh, have largely been uh, figured out in terms of where they can be productively deployed in the industry. Yeah. I mean, I think for this one, this is where the perfect historical context comes in from, from you know, neural MT introduction, statistical MT introduction. Those are the two that I think are closest to what we're having right now uh, in terms of the in terms of the mindset that we need to have, which is it always starts off the same. And I think to prepare yourself for this, remember that it always starts off with the hype, the money, everybody's pouring their money into this or you know, every, it's getting some level of attention. The concerns are always the same. It starts off with security. Is this secure? Is this not secure? Oh my God, you know. So, you know, with, you know, uh, statistical MT in the early days, I do want to point out different time from a technology standpoint, but everybody's like, yeah, this is great, but it's on the cloud. We're not going to put our stuff on the cloud, right? Look at us now. We put everything on the cloud, right? So, right. you know, a, there's, there's always these concerns. So right now with Gen AI, a lot of it's like, oh, but we're sending stuff off to, it's not secure. It's, you know, off to these systems, they're not secure. How do we keep that secure? It's always these kinds of same concerns in the beginning. Um, I guess kind of preparing mentally for that, you know, the level of hype that is going to be around these things is eventually going to hit reality. Now that reality will also move though. What I mean is the, 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 in 2016, everybody's concerned about neural MT security. I remember there was a huge controversy for a, a company, I think it was called, Tra it's not translations.com, it was translate.com, where somebody had fed some translations or some stuff they want to translate it in, and it had like social security numbers in it or something like that, some personally identifiable information. And then the next time somebody asked for a translation, it spit it back out. This might have been during the statistical MT days, but anyways, it spit it back out to other people. Um, you know, those security concerns 
eventually get closed out, right? So for generative AI, we're gonna close out things like security concerns. Um, but at the same time, people are gonna start to see the limitations. We're gonna start to see more lawsuits like we did with this one where the lawyers got punished for creating fake case law. We'll probably start to see those and people will slow down, right? So I, I don't know if I can really look into the crystal ball and predict the future. I just know that certain things that we're worried about right now with Gen AI are going to solve themselves soon, especially because the attention on this is greater than st statistical MT or neural MT. Everybody in the world's looking at this, whereas you know, neural MT comes out, only language technology geeks are looking at that. Um, now everybody's looking at this thing. Um, so I think it'll solve, they'll solve these issues as we go on and we'll eventually find this kind of perfect balance point where we figured out what it can do and what it can't do, just like we did with neural empty. We figured out what it can and cannot do. And we will have a clear vision of that probably within, don't quote me on this, probably within the next two to three years, we're going to have a really good idea of what it can and cannot do. And then we'll start working on the limitations of it and we'll see what comes up next, right? Quantum MT, right? QMT or quantum quantum language models that can, you know, do all the stuff that the previous generation couldn't do. Because each one of these, the systems do something that the previous one couldn't do, right? So we'll see where it goes. I don't know if that fully answers your question, Bull, but anyway, it, it, it was a it shot. Does. It you was, gave me a tough was, question. I don't know if it fully It was a pretty that. esoteric question. I think you did That's a good okay. job with it. Thank you. I gave an esoteric a great, answer. <laughs> great, <laughs> there's a great question uh, from the audience. I, I, I thought so anyway. Um, and that is, do you think generative AI could accelerate a shift away from translation in certain contexts, like copy, marketing, that kind of stuff, and towards direct in-language content creation, um, because obviously the generative part speaks to the ability to just create, you know, basically transcreate, create content from scratch. Yeah. Um, is that going to begin to pull some of the content creation, creation operation uh, into a different paradigm where it's created in the, in the, uh, you know, in the target language rather than translated from a source language? What do you, what do you think about that? I can't give a yes or no. All I can say is, of course, we're experimenting on that. And that's what I mean by these next two to three years are going to help us figure that out. I mean, um, just like, again, looking to history, neural MT in the beginning, we tested it on tons of things. People were trying different things, you know, statistical too. People were building Moses engines and statistical, you know, their own custom Moses engines, which uh, it, it was with statistical MT, we began to be able to customize MT. So people started building Moses engines, which were, you know, customized stuff. And we started testing, can it do better, right? So it's the same thing here. It's like, can Gen AI create copy by looking at a reference copy that is good enough that people go, oh my God, this is amazing and it's perfect, it's exactly what I need. You know, I think we're just still figuring that out right now. And I, I don't have the answer, but I'm sh almost positive that, you know, in the next three years, we're going to have the answer. Not only are we going to have the answer, we're going to have products that can do it, right? Um, the tech companies, this is not just limited to language tech anymore, right? We're now having tech companies pop up that we've never seen before, kind of in our space now, kind of the Lennart and Housebees of, if you will, of the, of the, current time rather than the 90s popping up and saying hey we've got a technology that can now do copywriting in 20 languages you just feed it here's your english copy and you press a button and it generates you know uh, you know six languages of unique copy based on a style guide that you upload based on uh, the initial english draft that you give it and this and that and bam it'll create content right i assume those tools are coming but Actually, I don't assume, I'm almost 100% positive those tools are coming. Uh, it's just a matter of them being tested, checked, and us all vetting to whether they are really producing what we want or not. A lot of money will pour in, again, looking at historical context, a lot of money will pour into this, a lot of people will lose money. That's, that's a pattern of the language industry that never stops. Money pours in, a lot of people lose money, a few people survive and live on. And the funniest thing I think I've learned from that is I've stopped trying to figure out who's going to survive and who's not. Because every time I say somebody's not going to survive, 
they survive. So I seem to be a horrible predictor of who is going to survive into the next decade. Uh, every time I've made a prediction like that, I have been dead wrong. <laughs> and some of those companies have gone on to become billion dollar companies. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is one of the things that's more enjoyable about the industry for all of our uh, trying to get control of our understanding of the future by looking to the past and everything. We do know that, you know, honestly, personally, for me, to our delight, uh, a lot of it is going to surprise us um, and be interesting and fascinating and dots are going to get connected that we have not connected um, to this point. I think certainly the move, uh, ultimately what localization is about is about uh, addressing audiences in different languages and cultures um, and the, the migration perhaps away from localizing source content for those cultures and towards simply creating content for those cultures uh, from scratch. Um, I think that's something that the that, that generative AI is going to help accelerate with. So that'll be interesting. Could be. Yeah. And maybe, from... and just like, you know, as many people have already said, not to repeat things that other people have said, but it might give us a good initial first draft, just like machine translation can give us sometimes a decent first draft to start with. Right. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's something, right. It's something, and it is a move. I, I think, you know, Anybody who predicts humans are disappearing from language work is quite wrong. Uh, right. I, I can even look at my own company, Procore. I, I go ahead, try to find me a Japanese construction professional. Like, it's not, I have trouble just finding a human who can do it. So, uh, you right. know, computers being experts in Japanese construction law and and how project management in Japan is done around construction. Um, you know, yeah not going to happen. So, uh, you know, humans are very much still going to be part of the process, no matter what moving forward. Uh, maybe, you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. But, you know, again, historically, we've seen this story over and over again, and it always ends the same way. People are not eliminated. In fact, right. most of the time, more jobs are created. So, yeah, people, <laughs> people move up the value chain and yes. technology gradually encroaches on the bottom of the value chain and helps accomplish more of the um, uh, sort of repetitive tasks. That's definitely a pattern that definitely. I've seen. Definitely. So we're not, we're not going to hold you to this because you kind of answered it earlier that you're not necessarily a good, good person to determine this. But one of the questions from the audience is, which new roles do you think we'll see in the near future in our industry? And, and, and I mean, you can kind of see yeah. where it's going, right? Yeah, Copy yeah. Editing. So what would you what would you have to say about that? Again, no one's going to hold you to. You know what's funny? I, I will point out one thing I've seen that historically changed with this latest turn. I was, again, because I'm a horrible predictor of things, I was like, even before, before this whole Gen AI thing, I was like, you know what? Localization engineering you know, which I started off in, it's mostly been, it's mostly moved offshore out of the US. We mostly do it offshore in, in other places. Not too many people do localization engineering or a lot of the localization geekery tech work anymore. I'm starting to see a shift back again because with this whole thing, it's so new that it, it, people are getting involved back in the tech side. So it's interesting. I think the technical roles are starting to come back. So that's one thing where before the technical roles, I felt like it was mostly kind of aiming towards, we're probably going to do mostly project management in our area. Now I see the tech roles are kind of coming back again. You know, you see, uh, just to throw out, not to, not to state, you know, I'll, I'll be kind and I won't mention competitor names, but let's just say other LSPs out there are building um, full AI divisions now. Maybe you guys are as well. Um, so that shows you like kind of the re-rise of, of, of technical roles. And those AI teams are being pre built primarily in the country of origin or the headquarters location of that particular company. So where before it was like, oh, DTP, DTP used to always be done in-house. I mean, back when I started, you know, in 2000, we did all localization work, even translation work was done in-house oftentimes. Um, and then all those tech roles moved offshore. I remember when at Bound Global Solutions, they came to me and they said, John, no longer are you going to actually do the localization engineering work. You're going to create loc kits, so documentation, that tells the people in Poland how to do the work. You're just going to prep everything and send it off to them. And I was like, what? And I, just like anybody else, was worried about my job. I was like, what? Oh, my God, where'd my job go? 
it, it's not that my job, you know, disappeared. It just shifted. I, I now had to kind of be a leader, world, a global leader for our engineering teams um, based in the U.S. But I'm starting to see, again, the shift back to engineering jobs coming back. So that answers hopefully that piece of the question. Project management will never go away. Nobody, every company that I've seen that every client, uh, yeah, client side company I've seen that laid off their localization staff, go back and check their job postings now. They hire, they're hiring them back again. You know why? No person who's, uh, you know, uh, an engineer in a, in a tech company wants to deal with this stuff. They need somebody to deal with it. So ultimately, anytime they lay these people off, they just end up hiring them right back. That, by the way, is another pattern of history you will see. Uh, every time localization teams get laid off, they end up hiring them back in spades. Sometimes they hire, they lay off one, and the next thing you know, they have three a year later. So uh, it's one that the tech companies could hopefully learn something from. They need to, you know, think about this stuff. Uh, what do you, what do you think is going on in tech right now, John? Why are we seeing tech, you know, like we have economic indicators that come out today with tremendous growth and expansion in America as of just today, uh, jobs are, are, are doing well, job growth is higher than what we anticipated, but we see this in tech. Do you have any thoughts around what's going on there? You mean why tech is kind of falling, falling, on its falling down? Bit. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, the rest of the economy. Yeah, I love economic news. So I do follow a lot of yeah. this. Yeah, yeah overall, too. we've had We've had the, you know, we've got the, it's the best time ever to have a job overall in the economy. Right. I know my students don't see this. They're like, oh my God, the, the job market is so bad. I'm like, no, it isn't. The job market is not bad. Right. The job market in tech for localization jobs on client sides looks bad, but overall the rest of the economy is doing quite well. And if you guys want to go work in hospitality, I promise you can get a job tomorrow, right? Even if you have no experience. Right. Um, so, you know. Why do I think it's happening? I think it's, again, historically, let's look at the dot-com bust of 2000, which is what I think we're seeing right now. The dot-com bust of 2000 showed exuberance for tech. People were all like, oh my God, this internet thing is blowing up. Everybody's gonna be digital. Everything is gonna be done online. You know, We had pets.com delivering dog food at a loss to your door with 50 pound bags of dog food, which now they're able to do through Chewy. Don't ask me how, but anyway, um, and losing money, everybody's losing money, losing money, losing money, but nobody cares. They just keep on investing in the market. Right. And then suddenly, boom, everything collapses. Right. We're seeing the same thing here. What happened was in, 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 during COVID, everybody moved online. So yeah. Same thing of the dot com bust. It was like everybody put their money in and Facebook grew, you know, insane. Everybody's growing, growing, growing. And then, you know, everybody goes back to like in person experiences again. We don't want to just buy stuff online anymore. We want to have experiences and, you know, everything that was old was suddenly new again, you know. Uh, and that is what has ultimately hurt the tech sector. You know, I mean, it, it, it is literally the dot-com bust all over again. It, it, we're, you know, tech is getting it, got it hard on the nose and everybody else was, was unscathed. It's happening again, but here's the funny thing with generative AI, we're, we're heading back up, right? We headed back up the hype cycle and the money is starting to come back in. So I don't know the, those of you who watch markets, but the markets have come up quite a bit very quickly with the whole release of all the open AI and all that, the, you know, things are coming back pretty steadily. And now the only thing that's um, really pushing us down is uh, rising interest rates uh, globally. So, and inflation issues. So. Yeah. I questioned the, the recent raise when things were stabilized. <laughs> yes. Anyways, yes. that's another conversation. Uh, that's a whole other conversation. I could have a whole conversation <laughs> on that one too. Yeah. A couple but, uh, of just but yeah, Go ahead, I, I think, it, I think I, so I just want to throw out one thing again. I just want to keep on pointing out context is everything, right? Yeah. For those of you who have been in this for 20 years, you're just not scared or scared of anything anymore. Honestly, you just kind of just, yeah, great. It's happening again. I mean, I literally just don't panic. I've gone through, I think, Four economic downturns in my life. This is just generically, economically, four economic downturns. So each time we have things like this happen, I just don't panic. Yeah. Because, I mean, we've already seen it before, but it's the same thing for our industry. Every time there's, you know, sudden round of layoffs and people are going, I'm like, yeah, that sucks. But it's not going to last forever, right? 
people are going to suddenly be like, oh, wait, maybe I do need a localization team. Oh, oh, you mean what? My developers aren't spending their time developing. They're managing Frenchy this and Germany that and, you know, Chinese here and Japanese. Why are they doing that and not developing? Why are we not using their time wisely? Well, because we laid off the localization team and now we're not doing that or we outsourced it and you know it's not looking good because we don't have internal people to control it. And they're like, what the hell? Why did we do that? And now they go and rehire everybody. Happens over and over. So for some of the younger leaders that we have on the call today that have you've either have been, you know, you've taught or have been have been at your school, it almost sounds like your biggest piece of advice, and you can agree or disagree and add add your piece is remain fluid because as long as you're fluid, there'll be a spot for you. Don't panic and just remain fluid. Totally. Would you agree with that? 100%. Yeah, just don't panic and wait it out. Like everybody gets so hung up on the moment. Yeah. But you've got to be thinking two and three years out when you work yeah. in localization. You can't be thinking about the immediate whatever is going on around you. Um, I've also survived, luckily, I've been very lucky. I've survived four or five layoff rounds, I think, uh, in my time. Um, I've survived every one of them. One of them, it came really close. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough to be spared, but not everybody gets spared. And But everybody I know who wasn't spared, who were good friends of mine, always find something, you know, within due time. I, you know, very few of them go two years without a job. Like, it just doesn't really happen. Yeah. So. So stay positive. If you are laid off right now, stay positive. <laughs> I, I promise you there, there's work on the horizon and I can already see localization jobs coming back. I keep a close eye on LinkedIn. They're starting to come back again. Um, people yeah. are afraid, afraid and, you know, things will, yeah. things will come back the just like they always do. I mean, this is the whole thing, right? We also had layoff 2020, my graduates who graduated in 2020 during COVID. I was so worried about that year. We had, that was a tough year, man. Could you imagine graduating in May, 2020? Uh, I mean, that, what a bad time to graduate. Uh, I mean, just the worst time. Nobody's hiring. Everything is, everybody's panicky, but they all ended up getting jobs quite quickly because suddenly, like I said, all this money flowed into tech. Tech started hiring like crazy, right? Um, all right the LSPs had to had to you know catch up. Um, we also saw this during the dot com bust. A lot of localization people laid off uh, and stuff like that. By the way, I just have to point this out because these are my other historical things. Sorry, I know we're almost running out of time, but so history of the dot com era. Anybody remember Planet Leap? Any Planet Leapers here? That tells you how, how, how fragmented our industry is and how small it was in the dot-com era. In the dot-com era, you had you know, three or four person companies running. So this is uh, Planet Leap. That's their mug. They were acquired by translations.com. So I got to collect some of their stuff. Here's one that's probably more popular for those of you who are older. I uh, got a Berlitzit. There you go. Berlitzit mousepad. Hmm? Hey now. <laughs> So Berlitz, the language company, uh, ran an LSP for a while, eventually sold it to uh, Bound Global Solutions. But uh, yeah. <laughs> um, one thing, I, one piece of advice I want to give to the audience, the young people out there, use your LSPs to look to network for jobs. They want your business and they're always knowing who's hiring and who needs what. So, you know, that's just a, a little tip for me. Uh, I do see my recommendation to, to students oftentimes when they're looking for client side jobs is approach salespeople at LSPs because they know when a company needs to be hiring yeah. a localization manager because they're dealing with people who probably aren't too low savvy trying to run a program and they might 100%. be thinking about hiring. Yeah. hundred so, percent. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, shoot. There was a question that was really good and I lost it. Do you, do you see that bull? We only have time for one more question. Yeah, was it about the, the linguist? Um, if you were a linguist now looking for a transition within the industry, would you go for lock engineering or business side? That was the Ooh, question. I don't know. I'd probably just go for ge just generic kind of localization project management or localization management for now, unless you love tech stuff. But if you absolutely love the techie side of it, you know, definitely dig in. I, I mean... I'd say it's just totally based on personal preference. If you're super tech savvy and you just love dealing with tech stuff, um, which I do, so um, but not everybody does. So 
I generally recommend just kind of getting the project management chops down because those are universal. You can use those in any role. So. so that's a good place to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, John, we can't thank you enough for your wisdom that you've imparted upon us today. Very interesting. <laughs> and I'm sure we could go in many different directions. It sounds like we may need to have a, a, a follow-up uh, all things global to to be continued uh, with other discussions. I particularly found the uh, some of the economic discussions quite interesting. Um, so, with that said, can you talk a little bit about MIS and what you do for MIS and and just kind of give us a high level overview? Yeah, sure. Um, so. I am an adjunct professor. I am not the person who is the you know person who gets to uh, hang out with the students all the time, full time. But I'm an adjunct professor at Miss. But uh, yeah, uh, I teach in uh, mostly the business side uh, for their coursework. Uh, and you know the program is great. I you know I definitely recommend it to anybody who's just kind of primarily people who are kind of tinkering around trying to figure out what they want to do with their. Uh, their degrees. If there's anybody here who has a, you know, a language major or a, you know, a language and culture major, a Asian studies major, a African American studies major, whatever, and you're trying to find a, a way to kind of get into, into a, a career, um, I definitely recommend this pathway. Um, you know, I think uh, localization studies is is a great area, uh, and uh, the localization degree or localization uh, management degree at uh, Miss is a great place to start. So, yeah, um, I want to you know shout out to the people who actually are there full time and are really holding that program down because uh, that is they are really the heroes of of that program. Um, it's people like me who just show up and hang out. And I say I'm like the fun uncle. I get to kind of show up, hang out with the kids, and then I get to hop on a plane two weeks later and leave. Like once they're all hyper and, you know, got their sugar rushes and everything, I get to go get on the plane and get out. But full of, it's the full, of, full of fun and candy. <laughs> right, exactly. But it's the full time people like, uh, you know, yeah. uh, like Ava and uh, and Max and Adam and, and who are there, you know, all day, every day, uh, really trying to craft the next generation of professionals in our industry. And I, you know, they're the ones who are absolutely deserve a lot of cool. kudos. We can't thank you enough. Um, it goes without saying. Uh, feel free to reach out uh, or DM John on LinkedIn if you have questions about MISS or the MISS program. Uh, also, it goes without saying uh, if you need any assistance building your custom program for language quality or translation and localization, MT, uh, AI, or SEO, or any original or content creation or trans creation. Uh, you always know that Bull, myself, and Domi are here for you, and feel free to DM us as well. Uh, other than that, we thank you for attending uh, this month's All Things Global, Episode 8, powered by Vista Tech, and we hope to see you at the next one. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon.